then Dr. Cutter, and we'll have time for questions at the end. If you would like to ask a question, please just click the raise hand button on your control panel, uh, and we'll connect to you via the phone. Uh, you can also enter a question in the chat box, and we'll relay that message. So uh, without further ado, Nicola, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Laura. Uh, this is Nicola, Deputy Director of the Cities Initiative. Uh, thanks for joining us for our fourth in a series of climate change adaptation webinars um, uh, prepared in association with the graduate student team at the University of Michigan. Uh, today's webinar is focused on social vulnerability and as it relates to climate change. Uh, as Laura mentioned, we're very pleased to have Dr. Susan Cutter joining us as our expert external presenter. Uh, Dr. Cutter's work and research um, integrates geographic information processing techniques with hazards uh, analysis and management. And she's worked in the risk and hazards field for more than 25 years as a recognized um, scholar nationally in this field. So we're very pleased uh, to have you join us, uh, Dr. Cutter. Uh, next slide. So the key questions that we'll be discussing today are, uh, what are the health and social impacts of climate change? Um, how do we care for vulnerable populations uh, with respect to these impacts of climate change? And how do we consider vulnerable populations in our climate change adaptation planning? Uh, also, we'll be focusing on how we engage the public and vulnerable populations in particular. And are there any tools, resources, and examples to assist uh, assist you in your work. And Dr. Cutter will be looking specifically at um, uh, social vulnerability index and uh, how you can develop those and use those in your work. Next slide. So let's first turn to health and social impacts of climate change. Next slide. So what do we mean by vulnerable populations? Uh, of course, children and elderly and the disabled have a particular health um, vulnerability, uh, so are vulnerable to certain changes in the climate. Uh, poor and lower income residents uh, also have a vulnerability in terms of their uh, ability to uh, relocate, uh, resiliency um, uh, when there are impacts that affect them. Uh, veterans, uh, health compromised community, that is those with uh, immunity issues. Um, immigrants, marginalized groups, single parents, uh, the homeless, uh, people living in vulnerable housing uh, near power plants or floodplains. Uh, all of these groups uh, can be uh, more vulnerable than the general population uh, when climate impacts uh, hit. Um, next slide. And why are they more vulnerable? Uh, well. Some of the reasons are their inability to respond or recover from events uh, provoked by climate change. And that can be due to one or more factors. Uh, limited resources to plan or respond to events. Uh, lack of support networks, uh, either cultural or ling linguistic isolation uh, from the general community. Uh, limited awareness or lack of education to understand the emergency messages that are being sent out. Uh, limited opportunity to express their unique needs, and a presence of uh, significant health problems or vulnerability that curtail their, their ability to respond or recover. Um, dependency on technology or living aids or medication or reduced mobility, uh, and hospitalization uh, or assisted care living. Uh, how are those people uh, cared for during extreme events? Next slide. So what has been shown to happen is that where there are inequalities in a community, these big climate events can exacerbate those inequalities and those vulnerabilities. For instance, low-income groups may have difficulty recovering from losses or property damage or displacement after an event uh, such as a storm. Um, we saw that happen and continue to happen uh, post-Hurricane Katrina or receiving health services in general uh, becomes difficult. 
Among the homeless, extreme weather may worsen pre-existing conditions like mental illness, disease, socialized, social isolation, or drug use. And many high-rise uh, high residents are low-income and new immigrants. And during an extreme heat event, uh, they may have less access to air conditioning. Or during an extreme storm, they may lose power and be unable to leave the building. So there are many inequalities that are exacerbated uh, during and post an event. These types of uh, climate change impacts have an impact on the health and social well-being of vulnerable communities, um, including urban heat, uh, air quality, flooding, and water quality issues, uh, seasons that are changing with climate change, uh, severe storm events, including winter storms like the one experienced only a short while ago in Buffalo, New York. So we're just going to look at some of these events and how vulnerable populations um, are affected. To start with urban heat, urban heat uh, has a number of impacts. The most obvious being uh, that people are overcome by the heat. Uh, they suffer from dehydration or heat stroke. It can also result in degraded air quality. And you can see that this, um, this image of Chicago uh, during a smog event uh, would impact anybody with uh, any kind of um, respiratory illness. During the heat waves in, uh, in the Midwest, air pollutants are trapped near the surface as atmospheric ventilation is reduced. And without strict uh, attention to regional emissions of air pollutants, the undesirable combination of extreme heat uh, and unhealthy air quality is likely to result. So climate change will likely cause an increase in surface ozone over the Midwest, partly driven by decreased ventilation due to warmer temperatures. And during these events, any groups with respiratory problems are warned to stay indoors during, um, due to the heat and the air pollution. And typically, you'll see emergency room uh, admissions spiking during these heat events, uh, particularly among the elderly. Cooling stations um, are established in some cities for those uh, living on the street. And I might point out that uh, since Ontario has closed its cold fire uh, generating stations, its smog days, even on the hottest days, have been almost uh, eradicated, um, uh, resulting in many fewer premature deaths on those days. So there is a, a correlation between uh, uh, increased heat and pollution. But if you can bring the pollution down, uh, the increased heat doesn't have as devastating an effect. Next slide. This slide uh, is uh, focused on European cities, but it really does uh, illustrate how um, mortality rates rise dramatically around 28 to 30 degrees Celsius, or around 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And less curiously, if you look at Valencia, um, fewer people die, uh, perhaps because they are more accustomed to the heat. But you can see a, just an incredible spike in the uh, mortality rate um, in a number of cities uh, just around that temperature of around 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Next slide. So the frequency and severity of heavy rain events um, is increasing and will continue to increase with climate change. The National Climate Change Assessment found that the top 1% of rain events has seen a 70% increase in precipitation. And this is causing extensive flooding in the Great Lakes region. We've heard this from our members from Thunder Bay and Duluth to Grand Rapids and Toronto and the GTA region, uh, that these flooding events are occurring uh, more often. And those who live in low-lying areas or floodplains are obviously particularly susceptible. And the aftermath of such flooding can be economically devastating to those living in damaged homes, particularly those who discovered uh, that they are uninsured for such events. Increased stormwater runoff as a result of heavy rains is also impacting water quality in the Great Lakes and its drinking water supplies. Worsening algae conditions in Lake Erie are in part attributed to heavy and more frequent uh, rain events. This summer, 400,000 people in and around Toledo were without water for three days due to microcystin toxins detected in their municipal water system, 
And this toxin grows in the algae masses in the western basin of the lake uh, that, again, uh, seem to be proliferating in part as a result of warmer temperatures and runoff due to climate change. And speaking of runoff, if we just go to the next slide about combined sewer overflows. Uh, during storms, combined sewer overflows can cause sewage uh, to flow into the lakes. Uh, and the Great Lakes are particularly susceptible. Of the 100 and, or 801 cities in the United States with active combined sewage systems, 65% are found in the Great Lakes states. NOAA scientists are improving their capabilities to forecast and warn people of poor water quality after storms. But when over a billion gallons of sewage is released into our rivers and lakes from CSOs during heavy rains, water quality is clearly diminished and often beaches are closed. And it is these big storms that the plants um, are finding difficult, that they simply do not have the capacity to handle the volume and the systems uh, overflow. And combined sewer overflows can also negatively affect human health since waterborne diseases in drinking water can be more prevalent after heavy uh, storm events. In 1993, an outbreak of cryptosporidium occurred in Milwaukee uh, right after a large storm causing 400,000 people to fall ill. Next slide. So another impact of climate change that affects uh, vulnerable populations is uh, the changing seasonal climate. So we're seeing shorter winters, earlier summers, um, falls that are wetter. Um, and all of these have an impact on uh, vector-borne diseases um, and the transmission from insects uh, with longer survival periods now that winters are milder. And so we are seeing in southern Ontario um, West Nile virus uh, that is spreading um, north and east in Canada uh, that we didn't see before. And uh, there are other new local infectious diseases that, again, will have a longer um, period to be able to survive than they used to when we had colder, longer winters. And so these types of diseases uh, obviously are particularly uh, difficult for chronically ill people and those with impaired immune systems and compromised health. Changing seasonal climate will also have an impact on shifting crop growth and harvest cycles, timber lines, and floral and fauna, faunal migration. And so those communities that are very much dependent on natural resources, forestry, and agriculture uh, may become uh, vulnerable depending on the impact of these seasonal climate changes. Next slide. But this is where we see most of the, uh, the impact and the images that we see of the impact of climate change, and that is severe storm events. To give you a sense of how prevalent more extreme storms are, in 2012 alone, there were 11 extreme weather events in the United States, with each costing approximately $1 billion in cleanup costs. Now, every dollar spent on hazard mitigation saves about $4 in avoided disaster costs. So well worth it to work on adaptation in advance. Extreme events are not always water or heat related. They can also bring extreme winter conditions, buffaloes, record snowfall, was part of a predicted lake effect as a result of climate change when the cold air and the warm water create massive snowfalls on the south side of the Great Lakes. Next slide. Secondary impacts are something that we see, but we don't necessarily um, associate with uh, climate change. And that is that when we do have these big storms, uh, other things occur, uh, electricity failure. Uh, and then the electricity failure from a storm leads to foodborne diseases or illnesses, hypothermia, uh, hospital and transportation outages. Uh, for those on the line from Ontario, uh, the uh, image of uh, a GO train stranded in the waters uh, in the GTA area uh, was one that uh, was shocking to many people after the floods uh, in 2013. And water treatment or wastewater treatment shutdowns can occur as well as uh, was the case in Thunder Bay 
following their flooding. If you have a prolonged um, period without electricity or with um, the storm events like the ice storm uh, last, uh, last year in the GTA area, you may um, see food or water shortages. Uh, certainly that was the case uh, in the uh, 1998 uh, Quebec ice storm where the city of Montreal's water reserves came dangerously close to being depleted. And also physical injury, drowning, electrocution, and death uh, can occur <clears throat> even after events uh, due to uh, either slippery conditions or electrical wires uh, that are downed. There can also be indirect psychological health effects that can be made worse uh, amongst those with mental health and stress-related illnesses. Next slide, please. Superstorm Sandy, you know, sometimes um, we think of Superstorm Sandy and, and Hurricane Katrina as uh, kind of conditions that can't affect us in the Great Lakes region. And it is true that those are hurricane-related. They are coastal um, storms. Uh, but if you recall, with Superstorm Sandy, as it approached, there were actually some areas in the Great Lakes region that were wondering whether it was going to, uh, the hurricane was actually going to come inland and impact their communities. Um, I remember being at a city's initiative meeting at the time where some mayors felt they had to return to their communities because they were getting warnings that they may be hit and they had to be there uh, to help with the command center. That event caused $65 billion in damages and 125 deaths in the U.S. alone. 43% of the over half a million households asking for federal aid reported annual incomes of less than $30,000. Many low-income um, elderly and disabled residents in New York City's public housing complexes were stranded in their apartments uh, even for weeks after the storm uh, due to elevator outages. Other residents remained in the high-rises despite having no heat or power because they had nowhere else to go or no means to get out of their neighborhood. In other parts of the region, low-income people were unable to make it to food stamp centers uh, for assistance. According to a report from the U.S. Census Bureau, low-income people are particularly vulnerable to extreme weather events due to their poor housing quality, poor environmental conditions, and economic instability. When families lack economic security, an unforeseen crisis that causes financial hardship can jeopardize the ability of parents to pay the bills, put food on the table, and afford necessities such as childcare or medical expenses. When that crisis is a natural disaster, families on the brink can be driven deeper into poverty. There's also a concern that aid programs favor those who can take on debt, and federal aid programs require that victims um, to apply for loans before qualifying to apply for FEMA aid. Um, so that's a, a, an issue around uh, how people can cope in the interim uh, financially. The Furman Center found that 82% of the properties hit by Sandy were built before 1980, around the time the latest flood maps and building standards were established. Um, so it'll be very expensive to adapt these buildings to more frequent and stronger storms. Next slide. Uh, we are talking now uh, about caring for vulnerable populations. Uh, what, what does that entail? Next slide. So what can we do for vulnerable populations in our communities? We can do a number of things. We can improve our ability to identify the location of vulnerable populations and include this information in our municipal emergency operations plans. We can consult with geriatricians community health specialists and other experts in plan development to understand best, uh, the best ways to support low-income, minority, and at-risk populations. And we can improve uh, surveillance, communication, and emergency response during severe weather events, particularly for the elderly and transients who are historically hard to reach uh, during those times. And just generally supportive services for the elderly, uh, vocational training and career development, to enhance people's resiliency, uh, enhance immigration and citizenship services. All these uh, can help. I think this is a good point uh, to ask uh, Dr. Cutter to uh, talk about social vulnerability index and how these can be used 
in uh, climate change adaptation planning. Dr. Ketter? Great. Thank you, Nicola. Um, let's make sure that I can get my PowerPoints up. OK. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, this morning is to talk to you a little bit about the Social Vulnerability Index. Um, as Nicola has uh, pointed out quite eloquently, uh, vulnerability is the potential for loss or some adverse impact. Uh, we also look at it as the capacity to suffer harm. And the vulnerability requires information related to the intersection of people and their natural environment, uh, looking at social systems relative to the built environment. And this all happens in particular places. And so in order to understand and assess vulnerability, you actually need three different sets of information. And the questions that really are of interest are, what are those circumstances that put people and the places where they live at risk? Uh, what enhances the ability of these uh, populations to um, respond and recover? And are there differences between places? And the goal of vulnerability research is to actually provide the scientific basis for hazard reduction uh, policies. And it's with that understanding that the Social Vulnerability Index was created. And that is to, to empirically define a way in which one could measure vulnerable populations and compare the relative levels of vulnerability between places. Social vulnerability, then, really is the identification of those characteristics that influence the social burden of risk. And Nicola has pointed out what many of those characteristics are. The uh, development of our understanding of social vulnerability really is based on about 50 or 60 years worth of post-disaster field work where researchers would go into the field after an event and survey uh, populations to find out uh, what factors were influencing their lack of ability to recover or their lack of ability uh, to adequately respond uh, when those warnings were given. Uh, some examples to amplify what Nicola said. Uh, we know that special needs populations increase vulnerability, and they do this because oftentimes it's difficult to identify them. Uh, Nicola talked about the infirmed, but we also have transient populations. Um, people, for example, that are on a holiday, your tourist populations. Uh, oftentimes, uh, these folks are invisible in communities, and they're not counted in the census information because of the transient um, nature of the uh, populations. We know that elderly and, and children are more susceptible than others. We know that socioeconomic status influences vulnerability in a couple of ways. Uh, if the wealthy residents, they have more material goods to lose, but they also have greater ability to absorb those losses and recover because they have these kind of social safety nets like insurance. Uh, race and ethnicity uh, increase vulnerability in large part because of linguistic and cultural barriers, as was pointed out. It also affects uh, the post-disaster recovery funding in that they don't quite understand uh, how to gain access to the resources that are available. Uh, gender is an important consideration in vulnerability, social vulnerability because of the, the generally uh, uh, low wages that accrue to some of the gender-specific uh, employment categories and also the caregiving role uh, that takes place. And then uh, lastly, it's housing type and tenure. 
and we know that the um, mobile homes are uh, not the best uh, housing situation and are subject to uh, damage and that renters are often more vulnerable uh, than homeowners. So in creating the metric, we looked at all of these uh, indicators and developed profiles based on census information uh, for the United States. And the reason for picking census information was that we wanted to have the, a similar database that applied to uh, all places in the U.S. And we did this statistically by looking at uh, lots of variables and reducing them uh, in terms of uh, coming up with factors. That is, what are related things that uh, tell us the story about the social vulnerability. And we find things like socioeconomic status uh, comes to play, that age, that race and gender all influence this. We looked at this for our test case, which was 1990. We went forward in time. We went backward in time to see uh, how robust the mechanism was. And it does uh, work. And it continues to explain about 3 quarters of the variance in the data. Now, from our perspective as geographers, what we were interested in doing was, in fact, mapping this so that we could illustrate the differences between places. And because we know what is driving the vulnerability, we can explain some of the patterns uh, that we see here. For example, in South Florida, those areas highlighted in red represent the, the top 20%. The blues represent the bottom 20%. So we're actually interested in the extremes. And we can, based on our understanding of places, know that in South Florida, what is driving the vulnerable populations is related to age. Uh, and it's related to large influx of Hispanic populations. And this is very different than what you see in the lower Mississippi Valley area here, if you can see my cursor which is more related to female-headed households of African Americans where they have poverty um, populations. And that's different than what we see here in the Four Corners area in the Southwest, where the vulnerability is largely driven, again, by poverty populations. But in this instance, it's not African American, it's Native American populations. And so we can look at this geographically to see where the social vulnerability is greatest, but we can also use the index to see where and why, what are those driving factors. Now, the reason for the index is that vulnerability is more than just poverty, and it's more than just race. It's how these things interact with each other. And this is going to vary from place to place. And so the social vulnerability index gives us the capacity to actually see how these factors vary across different communities. Since the original development of SOVI, we have done some reformulation because that's what good scientists do. And we responded to some critiques that we got from our sociology colleagues who said, well, if you're looking at social vulnerability, we really need to get the built environment variables out because it was creating um, a uh, looking at, at high density and urban rather than really looking at those social and uh, economic characteristics. Uh, so we did that. We also had a new census in 2010. And there were changes in the variables that the census collected. And so we had to change the formulation a little bit in terms of the input variables. 
And we also found that there were some things that we had omitted in the original formulation that needed to be included, uh, such as access to health care, access to vehicles, and so forth. Uh, we also went to a more frequent uh, measure of updating our demographic information, which is the American Community Survey, which is done on an annual basis using a five-year running average rather than the decennial census. And when you do that uh, and change um, the, the way in which some of these variables are computed, you see a slightly different pattern. What we see, however, is that we are still looking at that 72% uh, or so variance that's explained, but it's explained by fewer factors, composite factors. And so we have race and class uh, combining together. We have wealth being its own entity, and the wealth actually reduces the vulnerability. We have elderly, uh, Hispanic populations, special needs populations, uh, Native Americans, and then service industry uh, employment. And the service industry employment is important because that's one of the first things to be affected in a disaster, that most people are not going to use child care services. They're not going to go get their nails done. They're not going to get their hair cuts. And these lower wage um, sectors are the ones that uh, employ many of the, the lower income populations uh, in these communities. So we were also interested in whether or not SOVI could be translated into other uh, cultural contexts, uh, such as Canada, but also uh, places that are relatively data poor. Uh, and have perhaps homogenous populations. And so we've done some testing uh, in places like Norway, where we actually can develop a social vulnerability index and show that Norway does have more socially vulnerable populations. And it's in the northern part of the country. And it really involves their indigenous populations, the, the Sami people. We can see in Brazil as well that it tends to work uh, quite well. The input variables are obviously different, but the algorithm or the approach that we suggest works. And then the last one is here in Indonesia. Again, we can see uh, that you can look at this and see that there's quite a bit of geographic variability in the social vulnerability in these places. So the question I think that is of interest to all of you is how do we make these uh, outputs useful to you in terms of policy and practice? And the way in which uh, to do that is to look at the social vulnerability in relationship to the exposure. Uh, or the hazards or risks that you're interested in examining. And this is an example from New Orleans. Um, the map here uh, looks at the social vulnerability index in the city of New Orleans. And then the map below it looks at the levels of flood inundation in the city. Uh, the darker blues are the higher flood inundations, more than four feet. And the reds or the pinks in the social vulnerability are the highest. And we can combine those two to look at the relationship between flood inundation and social vulnerability. And you can look at this in the darker shades illustrate where both of the flood levels were very, very high and where the social vulnerability is very, very high. And one would anticipate that it is in those areas that have both the high vulnerability and the high exposure or flood levels that these would be the places that would be slowest uh, to recover. And in fact, you can look at the map below it which is uh, a map that shows the residential deliveries of mail 
as one indicator of recovery. And we can see in the areas of, of orange uh, and the light colors here that we do find some similarities in those areas that are slow to recover um, based on the flood inundation levels and the social vulnerability. Now, there are some tools out there that allow you to look at the exposure. Um, there's a, a nice product that Climate Central put out that is looking at sea level rise. Um, right now, they've just done uh, coastal sea level rise for the Atlantic, Gulf, and Pacific coasts. They are working on the Great Lakes. And they can uh, use this particular uh, tool to see the projected level of sea level rise in communities. And I've just looked here at, at New York uh, State. And we have worked with them uh, to in, include the social vulnerability index. And when you do that, you can see that there are areas in the red that have a high level of social vulnerability and also the inundation. And this particular website allows you to zoom in and out at a very localized level, uh, generally at the census track uh, scale. So this is one. Uh, product uh, that has been developed. Another product uh, has been developed is from Oxfam. And Oxfam uh, had asked us to look at the climate sensitive hazards and look at it for the south uh, and the southeast. And so we can look uh, across different hazards. And we can map their distributions. Here is uh, uh, counties based on elevated flood levels, that is, the percentage of their county that is subject to flooding. We can look at drought using some of the drought indicators. Uh, down here, we have hurricane wind uh, and looking at the inland extent of wind from hurricanes. This one uh, down here in the southeast was Hurricane Hugo, who had actually hurricane force winds that went as far inland as Charlotte. Uh, and extended into Tennessee. And then, of course, we have the sea level rise. We can put these together with our social vulnerability to see where places have uh, the highest level of exposure and the highest levels of uh, social vulnerability, again, uh, this matrix here with the darker purples being uh, high on both. What's interesting about this particular map and the way to look at it is if you look at those areas in dark blue, your interventions here would be you would need to fix and do something about the social vulnerability because what you have is a medium level of social uh, vulnerability here, uh, as well as uh, a, no, reverse, a, a high uh, level of exposure, but a medium level of social vulnerability. And so what you would do in terms of your interventions here would be to go after the exposure. So I might suggest you elevate your homes, for example. The areas in red are areas that have a medium level of exposure and a high level of uh, social vulnerability. And the interventions here would be to do something to reduce the vulnerability. So this could be job training programs, et cetera. So you can very quickly, by looking at the map, determine at a glance what kind of interventions you may be looking for, those that are more socially oriented, those in the dark blue that are more oriented to the hazard itself, and then those in the purple where you have to do both. There is an online tool uh, that Oxfam has, which places um, and allows people to come in and customize and zoom in to look at specific county levels for this region. And 
uh, I recommend this tool. Uh, it's a, a nice exploratory tool that you can look at to see how these things relate to one another. And then there is a tool that uh, unfortunately is, is only available for the state of South Carolina, but this was our attempt at working with our state emergency management uh, division to put together a, a county level hazard assessment as part of the state mitigation plan. And this allows county managers to come in with three clicks to develop their exposure surfaces to develop their social vulnerability map, to put it all together, and then print the map in a format that they can just plug and play and put it into their hazard mitigation plan. Uh, we have developed this for the state. We are uh, talking with other entities about developing a, a customized version for other, other states. What we have also is you can, once the social vulnerability metric has been uh, produced, you can actually look at real-time phenomena and use it to track hurricanes, for example, to see what areas might be exposed. And this may help you in determining where you might want to pre-position assets uh, in order to facilitate the response and the recovery. You could do it, we did it for Hurricane Isaac, but you could also do it for some of the severe winter storms, for example. So to summarize, uh, it is possible to create social metrics uh, and to integrate these social metrics with the exposure or potential exposure that comes from these hazards. Uh, to create an overall perspective or an overall map. Um, we know, however, that a one-size-fits-all uh, hazard reduction strategy actually ignores some of the uh, social inequalities that the Social Vulnerability Index uh, points out. But also, we need to think about that if we can mitigate hazards in the short run, we're well on our way to adapting to climate change in the longer run. And so to give you the, uh, the briefing points about SOVI, is it is a robust algorithm. It has been used and continues to be used by uh, state and local governments in the United States. It was also used by FEMA in Hurricane Sandy as a way of determining uh, where, again, they might preposition uh, assets and where they needed extra help in terms of handling vulnerable populations in the recovery. We see that it does highlight disparities uh, in the abilities of the uh, communities and, and counties to recover from catastrophic uh, failures or exposures. Um, and it does help us in a policy sense to prioritize some of our mitigation efforts uh, and to understand that if you target some of the assets, you can actually improve the vulnerability rather than uh, giving all communities uh, equal resources when, in fact, some communities are less vulnerable than others. And with that, I'll turn it back to our moderator. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cutter. Uh, that was uh, quite fascinating and really hit the mark, I think, for what uh, municipalities needed to hear about how those social, the social vulnerability index can, um, can help in their planning. Um, I'd like to take advantage of you being on the line and just open up uh, the line for questions. Um, and then if we have a bit of time left, I'll continue with my slides. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Cutter? And remember that to ask a question, you just click the raise hand button on the right-hand side of your screen, or uh, you send a message via the chat. While people think about their questions, Dr. Cutter, maybe I could ask you a question, which is um, I'm, I'm quite interested in this pre-positioning of assets. 
by tracking where a storm may occur, uh, but also overlaying the vulnerability of, of, uh, of populations. Do, do you have any examples of that? I guess you mentioned FEMA, or do you have any um, suggestions of where we could go for more information on that? On how it's been used? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, the, how to overlay the vulnerability index with the tracking of a storm with the prepositioning of assets. That seems uh, like a pretty smart way of going about it. Right. Um, I don't know, um, because I'm not in the, in the federal <laughs> government, how they're you know, thinking about the prepositioning of assets. But um, the development of the index is there, and it's just a matter of putting the storm track on top of it and then giving that information to the emergency management community. And from, from that, then they can make that determination of, of where they want to position the assets and, and how many assets and so forth. So it's part of the preparatory process as emergency managers are, are gearing up um, in the Emergency Operations Center, for example. Interesting. Well, you know, to, to the people on the line, I'd be interested in knowing if anybody has used this or um, would be interested in using the SOVI uh, for emergency response. I think that's, uh, that's something that our organization should explore a little bit further. We do have a question from Christine. Uh, Christine, you are on the line. Christine, go ahead whenever you're ready. Hello, can you hear me now? Yep. yep. Okay. So our question was just about the level to which data um, can be put into these maps. Um, can you go down to like a postal code level if, it, if you have data available? We have tested it down to the block group level, which is actually smaller than a postal code. Oh, okay. And we've also done it at the census tract level. Uh, because the input data comes from the American Community Survey, we find at the block group level across the nation that the margin of error is greater than the value in the cell. So we don't recommend working at the block group level because the data just are, are not that good. But you can work at the census tract level, which uh, has reasonably good data um, at, at that scale. Okay. So you can go from, from census tract um, to county to um, state. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Dr. Cutter of how this might be used in your community, whether it's already being used? We have a brief question of wondering if this webinar will be available to view later, and it will be on the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence City's website. And I should point out that there are more resources in the uh, online version of the webinar, um, because the, uh, the, the University of Michigan students that have put these webinars together are uh, so eager to uh, provide resources. They have literally pages of resources that you can click on. Uh, or just note the, uh, the hyperlink, and, uh, and you can find more information on each of these subjects. So um, please do go back to our website, take a look at uh, both the recorded uh, version of this, but also the PowerPoint presentation will be online, and you can take a look at some of the slides that didn't appear today. Also, um, there is a website for SOVI. It's called SOVIUS.org. And it goes through and explains um, about the index. Uh, on that uh, website are examples of county and city governments that have used it, um, publications that have used it, et cetera. Um, and so that also is an, uh, an additional resource uh, for all of you. And you can certainly uh, contact us at the Hazards and Vulnerability Research Institute, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? We'll make sure to have that uh, website on our list of resources as well. Any Great. other uh, Any other questions for Dr. Cutter? 
I don't see any other questions coming through. Okay, thanks, Laura. So hearing yes. none, um, we will continue with our webinar just for the remaining minutes. Um, and then uh, there will be, like I said, some slides that we don't get to um, that will uh, be of interest to you. So please do look at them. Um, so Laura, I am just going to go to uh, skip down a little bit to slide number. 23, Tools, Case Studies, and Resources. And so perhaps we could just go to slide number 24, Mapping Tools. And I wanted to focus on this slide because uh, Lacey, the uh, University of Michigan's Great Lakes Adaptation Assessment for Cities, has worked with an organization in Montana called the Headwaters uh, Economics Institute. And Headwaters Economics has done um, some quite impressive mapping around um, socioeconomic vulnerability and health vulnerability and climate change in the Great Lakes region. And so you can see on this slide, this is St. Louis, um, and it looks at um, the economic sectors that might be vulnerable to climate change, whether it's agriculture or tourism related. And then they would uh, overlay uh, some information about some of the health services related in the area, in the area and some socioeconomic indicators as well to uh, not only chart out vulnerability, but what vulnerability may develop over time as a result of changes in the climate and the ability for the health sector to respond. Uh, so those, that's very interesting work that, um, uh, that Headwaters Economics has done. Um, it's an interactive map, so um, you can uh, go in and uh, take a look at uh, the features. Uh, and they have information, statistical information, on over 225 counties uh, throughout the Great Lakes region. Next slide. And here's an example. You can see, hopefully, uh, the particular characteristics that uh, this uh, is looking at, uh, age, um, whether they're below the poverty line, uh, whether they live alone, um, where there are areas without vegetation, uh, um, education level, uh, race, um, some particular health um, uh, pre-existing uh, conditions like diabetes. Um, and then uh, look at things like summer temperature, so how those would overlay to summer temperature. So uh, for those uh, on the line in the US, you may want to uh, check that out. And the, um, the website is, uh, is listed in our presentation if you go to, the, uh, to our website. Next slide. Another one to look at is uh, something called Building Resilience Against Climate Effects. It's a funding-based tool um, prepared by the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And it was used um, in the Cook County Climate Change and Public Health Action Plan. Um, so there are five steps to the BRACE framework. I won't go into them in detail, but that's one uh, that you can take a look at uh, in greater detail. And then if next slide. Another one to look at is one uh, that is uh, being developed under the auspices of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's called the Community Vulnerability Assessment Tool. It also uses geospatial analysis to inform uh, about vulnerability assessment. And it provides guidance for assessment of hazard risk uh, vulnerability at the municipal level. Uh, so that's one uh, that you may want to take a closer look at. And again, we have a, uh, a link to it uh, in this presentation. And then we're just going to skip down to uh, slide 29. So skip CVAT step by step and just go to uh, the training tool for rural communities. This one's called the NGT338, Risk and Vulnerability Assessments for Rural Communities. And uh, this is developed by the Rural Domestic Preparedness Consortium, which was uh, created by the Department of Homeland Security to help rural emergency responders. It's an eight-hour instructor-led course on, um, at management level. It's designed to educate participants on the need for uh, and basic components of a comprehensive risk and vulnerability assessment. 
uh, that brings together stakeholders from the public and private sector. Uh, the information drawn from a, um, a proper and all-inclusive risk and vulnerability assessment provides the essential foundation to design and develop your effective community-wide emergency response plan. And the participants learn the benefits of, edu of evaluating a community's susceptibility to potential hazards and identifying strategies for mitigating the risk of, uh, of serious consequences. Uh, so that is one uh, to look at uh, more closely if you're in a rural context or partly in a rural context. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, a little bit of information about the Cook County case study, which of course includes the city of Chicago. Uh, and they have done a, uh, a public health action plan related to climate change. It's one that is worth looking at. Uh, Cook County, including uh, uh, Chicago and the greater area, is, uh, has a population of 5 million people, second most populous county in the United States. And the Midwest has been uh, identified as one of the areas that will experience the greatest uh, number of um, climate change related illnesses and death. Um, and so Cook County felt it needed a strategic plan to equip and prepare public health officials. Um, so I won't go into the details of them, but we do have uh, a bit of information on those. And I'll just skip down one more slide, Cook County's goals and resources, skip that, and then skip the next one and go down to slide 33, Albany, uh, New York, has also developed uh, a vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan that is uh, important to look at. Its uh, plan builds off of the uh, climate aid report by analyzing how climate change could affect people, infrastructure, and natural resources. And it's sought to um, offer recommendations and strategies for improving the city's resilience and adaptive capacity. So we have more information and a, um, and a link to the Albany uh, climate change plan as well. So I think at that point I will, um, I will end the um, the webinar, uh, I do want to thank Dr. Cutter for her excellent presentation. I think many people will be interested in learning more about SOVI, Dr. Cutter, so we will uh, put that website uh, onto our list of resources. And uh, thank you for sharing your expertise today. You're welcome. I would also suggest uh, that you look at NOAA's Digital Coast product. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this also includes SOVI for all coasts, including the Great Lakes. Excellent. Thank you. So we that's will. another source. Excellent. So we will. Uh, we have good connections in NOAA, so we'll make sure that we have that uh, on the list as well. Excellent. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Cutter, and thank all the participants as well uh, for uh, participating on this uh, particular webinar. And uh, please do look at the resources that we have online, as well as. Uh, if you go to our website, you can uh, register for our next uh, webinar, which will be on water, wastewater, stormwater, and adaptation. And that will be in the new year, January 14th at this time, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern. So just register on our website. Uh, and until then, have a great uh, end of year season, and uh, we will see you in the new year. Thanks very much.